Welcome to this Advanced English Masterclass. Today, I'm sharing my best English language lessons with you. And how do I know they're the best? Because they're the ones that you have watched the most, that you have liked and commented on and shared the most. So they're the best because you say so. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. First, we're going to review a news article. And in this news article, you're going to learn a lot of advanced vocabulary, advanced grammar, and even improve your pronunciation. Let's get started. Welcome to our article. Today, we're talking about US President Joe Biden touching down in Ottawa. Ottawa is where I live, which is why I chose this article. And I'm sure you recognize this man. He's the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. So let me read this headline again. U.S. President Joe Biden touches down in Ottawa. First, let's talk about this phrasal verb, touch down. And notice we have an S on it because it's conjugated with Joe Biden, which represents the subject he. U.S. President Joe Biden, he touches down in Ottawa. Now, to touch down, this means to land, and we use it specifically for a plane. As an example, I could say my plane just touched down, which means my plane just landed. To be honest, I would say that landed is more common than using the phrasal verb touch down. So if you're already comfortable with using what time does your plane land, my plane just landed, I say keep using it, but at least now you know what it means when you see it. Okay, let's continue on and talk about his trip in Canada. U.S. President Joe Biden arrived Thursday evening in Ottawa, for a whirlwind 27 hour visit. Now, first I want to point out that for everyone who doesn't know, the capital city of Canada is Ottawa. It is not Toronto. I think probably 90% of people think the capital city in Canada is Toronto. That's just not true. <laughs> Ottawa is the capital city which is where all the official government business takes place and which is why President Joe Biden is visiting Ottawa and not Toronto. Toronto is Canada's largest city. Okay, so make sure you know that the next time someone asks you about the capital of Canada. Arrived Thursday evening in Ottawa for a whirlwind 27 hour visit. Okay. What is a whirlwind? Whirlwind. Pronunciation. Whirlwind. A whirlwind. Now this is being used as an adjective and we often describe an event uh, like a visit, a meeting, a vacation, a conference as a whirlwind vacation, a whirlwind conference, a whirlwind meeting. A whirlwind visit is simply a visit where many, many things happen in a short period of time. So very active, many different activities. So he's going to go to a lot of different places, meet a lot of different people as well. And that's why you could describe your vacation or a meeting or a conference or even your summer. I had a whirlwind summer. It implies that you did many, many different things. You saw many, many different people. So I would say busy, eventful, see lots of people things. That's how I would describe it. And this is an adjective. So it's an adjective. So as an adjective, you would put it before what you're describing. Expected to focus on both the friendly and thorny aspects of the Canada U S relationship. Okay. So friendly, you know what that means. What about thorny? Well, thorn is 
something very sharp and a thorn hurts you. So that's kind of what you want to imagine. Those aspects of the relationship that are thorny, that can hurt you. So in this case, I would just say the positive aspects of the relationship, that's the friendly aspects. And then the thorny are the negative aspects of the relationship. Because obviously these two countries probably don't share the same opinion on every single topic. They probably have some debate that they're going to have as well. So that would be, I would just summarize it as negative, negative. So you could describe your relationship. I have a thorny relationship with my boss, with my coworker. So you're saying, you know, it's negative. There are things that hurt each other in that relationship. Okay. Thorny aspects of the Canada U S relationship. I don't know what those aspects are. <laughs> I guess right here, including protectionism and migration on both sides of the border. So I'm not sure if these are the friendly aspects or the thorny aspects. They don't really specify. Now, actually, before we move on, I want to talk about the pronunciation of Canada because I actually hear a lot of mispronunciation because of syllable stress. So a lot of students will put the stress on the wrong syllable or they won't put any stress on it. So it's Canada. It's not Canada. Canada. Sometimes I hear that where the da is really strong. Canada. No. Canada, Canada. Okay. That's how you say it. Like an American, like a Canadian. <laughs> Canada. So this da is quite short. Canada, Canada. So now you know the capital of Canada, the largest city, and you know how to correctly pronounce it. All of these notes are available in a lesson PDF. So you can look in the description or the comment section to download the free lesson PDF. All right, let's continue on. It's quite a packed schedule. So a packed schedule, this is just another way of saying busy, busy. Now you could also think of it as crowded because you can say, the event, the event was packed. And in this case, packed means crowded. So there were many, many people in the event. So you couldn't really move around. It was crowded, but because we're talking about a schedule, it really more means busy. Now, honestly, you could use our same adjective as before and probably say it's quite a whirlwind schedule because what is a busy schedule? It's when you do lots of things, see lots of people, meet with lots of people. Well, that's also kind of the definition of busy, right? So you could use our other adjective whirlwind, or you can use packed as well. And then know that packed can mean crowded at the same time. So in terms of busy, you could say my weekend was packed. My weekend was packed, which means it was busy. Now, sometimes we actually add, which is kind of fun. I like saying this. We add the word action in front. Oh, my weekend was action packed. You don't have to say that. You can simply say packed, but that's just an option. Action packed or packed. All right. It was quite a packed schedule for a short trip, said White House National Security Council spokesman. Whew, that's a long title. John Kirby on Wednesday. This is a meaningful visit. Canada is one of the United States closest allies. Notice they have this apostrophe. This is to show possession. The United States closest allies and friends. So the allies belongs to the United States. The friends belong to the United States. So that's why now generally with possession, I would say that's my friend's shirt. So that is when I'm talking about my one friend, right? 
So my one friend, singular. Now this S is not plural, it's to show possession, it's to show the shirt belongs to my friend, okay? Now I could say, that's my friends, because I can say my friends and it could be plural. That's my friends, what could be a multiple item belonging to my friends? That's my friends dog. <laughs> okay. Let's say I have two friends and they live in the same house and they share one dog. So the dog belongs to my friends, two friends, plural, but I just put the apostrophe here because there is already an S. So I don't need to put another S because that looks weird, right? So you don't need to put another S if it ends in an S. And this is to show possession. This is also to show possession. Okay. Canada is one of the United States closest friends and al allies and friends and has been now for more than 150 years. Why is it 150 years? Because that's how long Canada has been a country. It's been 152 or three years. <laughs> that's why they say more than. So since we became a country. This will be the first true in-person bilateral meeting. A bilateral meeting is a meeting between two people. So it's just another way of, of saying two people. I don't know why they really said it because it's already implied because it's Joe Biden and Trudeau and they're two people. Anyway, you could say I'm having a bilateral meeting with my boss. And this implies that the meeting is between you and your boss because bilateral is with two people. Now, let's say it's actually my boss's friend. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. So I'll say friend. But notice this is possessive because the friend belongs to my boss. Boss already ends in S. So I don't need to put another S there. If it were the other way around, my friend's boss I put apostrophe S because it does not end in S. And this is also showing possession. I have a bilateral meeting with my friend's boss. Okay, let me highlight that for you. Between the two leaders in Canada since 2009. So it will be the first true in-person bilateral meeting. Now adding in person, because obviously in the last few years, a lot of meetings have taken place online. So it suggests that it's possible they had an online bilateral meeting. It's possible. Now notice we have since, since plus a specific time, since 2009, since last summer, since March 5th. And we use for with a time period for two weeks, two years. Now in this context, four doesn't work. You wouldn't replace. It will be the first in-person meeting for two weeks. It doesn't make any sense. So we can't replace it with four, but I'm just letting you know that there are specific times when you use sense or for in other cases, because I do see mistakes with those. In this case, we need to use sense and we're, we have to have a specific time because sense is only used with a specific time. Okay. The first year of Biden's term, so here's another possessive, the term belongs to Biden. The first year of Biden's term focused on rebuilding Canada-US relations following Trump's divisive term in, in office. All right, let's take a look at this, focused on rebuilding, rebuilding. So notice a couple things. One, it's in the gerund form. My verb is in the ing gerund form. Why? 
because I have a preposition here. On is a preposition. And when we have a preposition, your following verb, in this case, rebuilding, needs to be in the ing, in the gerund form. So that's our gerund. So I'll just write that out for you. Preposition plus gerund. Now we have a re in front of building to say is happening again. So we're building it again. You might say, Jennifer, this lesson was awesome, but I need to re-watch it. I need to watch it again. Why? Well, because you need to practice everything I'm teaching you in this lesson, right? I need to re-watch this lesson at least <laughs> three times to really fully learn everything I'm teaching you in this lesson because I'm going quite fast, aren't I? So this means watch again. And notice for pronunciation, re, e. I'm not doing like a schwa sound, re, re, re watch. American pronunciation, we love our unstressed schwa sound in our throat here, but I'm not doing that. This is a full E, re, rewatch, rewatch, watch it again. So hopefully you rewatch this lesson. Let me know if you're going to rewatch it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this divisive, 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 divisive. Trump's divisive term in office. Divisive comes from the word division, division, which also comes from the word divided. <laughs> when people are divided, when there's division between a group of people, it means some people think this and other people think that. And divisive is the adjective that's describing that. As an example, I could say his policy is very divisive. It causes some people to be here and other people to be here. It causes division. It divides people. So it's implying that Trump caused division between the United States and Canada, or at least their relationship. Let's continue on. The second focused on meeting obligations. The second, remember here we are talking about the first year of Biden's term. Now we're talking about the second, the second year of Biden's term. The second focused on meeting obligations. So again, on is our preposition. So we have our gerund here, meeting obligations, including prioritizing orderly and safe migration through regular pathways, Kirby said. Now heading into the third, the third year of his term, heading into, we use the word head as a replacement to the word go. So you could say going into the third term. Going, or I guess in this case, you might want to think of it as entering, but go, there's movement, right? And enter, there's movement as well. I'm going into the store. I'm entering the store. Now, we do use head a lot. You could say, I'm heading to the store. When do you head to the airport? And in this case, it means go. I'm going to the store. When do you go to the airport? It's extremely common. It sounds very natural. Americans, we love saying head as a replacement for go. So you can start with these two expressions and then add on some more to your vocabulary once you get comfortable with them. Now heading into the third this visit is about taking stock of what we've done, where we are, what we need to prioritize for the future. Okay, when you take stock of something, you basically assess the current situation. So you might say, we need to take stock of 
are finances. So you need to think about your current financial situation and then perhaps the recent past of it and then going into the near future as well. So the current situation, including the past and the present. So let me just write that out for you. Let's take stock or we need to, we need to take stock of our financial situation. As I said, I think the best replacement would be assess. When you assess something, you think about the current situation. So assess, think about the current situation. And in this case, it's the current situation of your financial situation. <laughs> A little bit confusing there using situation twice. So this visit is about taking stock of what we've done. So assessing what we've done, where we are and what we need to prioritize for the future. So far, neither the White House nor the Prime Minister's office have confirmed if there will be any impromptu stops during the trip. All right, let's take a look at neither nor. I did create a separate video on neither nor because I hear a lot of mistakes with it. So I'll put the link to that video in the comment, but just know that neither is used when it's negative. So it's saying not the White House and not the Prime Minister. So it's negative for the White House and it's also negative for the Prime Minister. That's what I'll say now, just because I do already have that full lesson on it. So I will just say <laughs> link to lesson in the video description on neither nor. It's a great video and I highly suggest you watch it. Okay. So you can watch that when you have time. It's a pretty short video as well. Just trying to get this. Let me just put this on a separate line for you. Neither, whoopsie. Neither nor. Oh, okay. Got it. Whew. So far, neither the White House nor the Prime Minister's office have confirmed if there will be any impromptu stops. Well, what's an impromptu stop? It's an unplanned stop. Unplanned. It seems like it would be obvious that there would be unplanned stops. For example, if you and I were going on a vacation, we wouldn't plan out every single place, including cafes, restaurants, stores in advance and have that on an itinerary, right? If we felt like going to a cafe, we would go to a cafe. Obviously that's not how it works for the president for security reasons. Everything has to be very planned out so security can be present. So that's why an impromptu stop is unlikely. But it did happen when Barack Obama, former president Barack Obama, visited Ottawa many years ago. And that's what this picture represents. I'll continue reading this. So it hasn't been confirmed if there will be any impromptu unplanned impromptu stops during the trip, meaning we'll have to wait and see whether there will be another Obama cookie moment. If you come to Ottawa as a tourist, you will see this Obama cookie. It's very popular for tourists and it's because Obama visited Canada in Ottawa, where I live, the capital, remember? in 2009 and he had an impromptu stop, an unplanned stop. So he went to our tourist area, 
which is called the Byward Market. That's just an area of the city in our historic downtown where the tourists generally go. And he went to a bakery and he bought a cookie from that bakery. Remember, this happened in 2009. Today, if you go into that bakery, there are pictures of Obama everywhere. Like this picture is from the bakery. And this is a television. What I'm pointing out with my mouse is a television and it plays over and over again Barack Obama's trip in Canada from 2009. It's pretty funny because even now it's a big tourist attraction in Ottawa to come see this Obama cookie. So if Biden makes an impromptu stop, maybe we'll have a Biden cookie in Ottawa as well or something like that. Okay, we'll have to wait and see if there'll be another Obama cookie moment when then U.S. President Barack Obama popped into a bakery in the Byward Market during his 2009 trip. I like this phrasal verb to pop into. When you pop into a store, a cafe, a bakery in Obama's case, it means you just enter quickly. So you just go in, you get your cookie and you leave. So most likely you're not going to stay for two hours and have lunch with a friend. You're just going to get something and leave. So if you're with your husband or wife or a friend, you might say, is it okay if we pop into this store? I need to buy. And then you can just tell whatever you want to buy. Okay. Now, when you say pop into your friend, your husband, your wife, they understand that is going to be quick. So even if you're on a schedule, they know, okay, it's not going to take a long time. So if someone asked you like, oh, did you visit the museum when you were in Ottawa? You might say, we popped in, we popped in, which means you didn't spend a very long time. So this is the same as saying visited quickly. We popped in. We just took a few pictures, looked around, but we had another appointment to get to. We just popped in. So we use this a lot when you're going to stores or you might go pop into a friend's house, which means you visit that friend for a brief period of time. So my friend popped in on over the weekend, just sometime over the weekend. Oh, my friend popped in over the weekend. So she visited me quickly. That's what it implies. And that's the end of the article. So now I'll read the article from start to finish so you can focus on my pronunciation. U.S. President Joe Biden touches down in Ottawa. U.S. President Joe Biden arrived Thursday evening in Ottawa for a whirlwind 27-hour visit expected to focus on both the friendly and thorny aspects of the Canada-U.S. relationship, including protectionism and migration on both sides of the border. It's quite a packed schedule for a short trip, said White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby on Wednesday. This is a meaningful visit. Canada is one of the United States' closest allies and friends, and has been now for more than 150 years. This will be the first true in-person bilateral meeting between the two leaders in Canada since 2009. The first year of Biden's term focused on rebuilding Canada-U.S. relations following Trump's divisive term in office. The second focused on meeting obligations, including prioritizing orderly and safe migration through regular pathways, Kirby said. Now heading into the third, this visit is about taking stock of what we've done, where we are, and what we need to prioritize for the future. 
So far, neither the White House nor the Prime Minister's office have confirmed if there will be any impromptu stops during the trip, meaning we'll have to wait and see whether there will be another Obama cookie moment when the U.S. President Barack Obama popped into a bakery in the Byron Market during his 2009 trip. Amazing job. Now let's move on and review another news article. And this article is on a completely different topic and you're going to learn completely different vocabulary. So let's get started. Welcome to our article. You probably recognize these two celebrities, Will Smith and Chris Rock. Let me read the headline of our article. Will Smith says bottled rage led him to slap Chris Rock at the Oscars. So this is very important to understand our article. So slap, this is slap. It's a verb to slap. It's very commonly associated with violence. So in a negative way, however, you could slap a mosquito or a fly on your arm, for example. So you can use it in other contexts, but more commonly used in violence, fighting between two people. Okay, let me explain this because I believe this is mentioned again, bottled rage, bottled rage. So rage, of course, is an emotion. It means to be very, 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 very angry. Okay, that's rage. Now, what does bottled rage mean? Bottled Imagine here we have a bottle, right? And the water is in the bottle and it can't get out, right? So if you have a bottled emotion, rage, anger, jealousy, hatred, generally a negative emotion, it means that emotion is inside of you and can't get out, just like the water can't get out of this bottle. So it's when you have an emotion and you do not express it, you keep it inside of you. So if you keep anger, rage, jealousy, hatred inside of you, eventually it can come out and you might do something violent like slap someone. Let's continue on. Will Smith has said his bottled rage led him to slap comedian Chris Rock. Here's our comedian Chris Rock on stage at the Oscars in March. The actor has been interviewed for the first time since the incident, which he described as a horrific night. Horrific, this is a great adjective. A lot of times students will use very common adjectives, good, bad, because it's the ones they know. But adding more advanced adjectives will make your English sound more advanced and will give you more color to your language as well. A horrific night. So this is a very, very, very bad <laughs> night. That's how you can think of it. A very, very bad night. So if somebody asks you, how was your day? You could say, I had a horrific day, which means very, very bad. Or you can describe an event that was horrific. That was very, very bad. When I saw Will Smith slap Chris Rock, that was horrific. So you can say, I had... I had a horrific day. All right, let's move on. Appearing on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, he said, I was going through something that night, you know? Now, our he is Will Smith. So just remember that through the story, he, unless said otherwise, is Will Smith. I was going through, so I, Will Smith, I was going through something that night, you know? So he's describing what happened that night when he slapped the comedian Chris Rock, that horrific night. I was going through something. To go through something. 
This is an expression, and we use this say to experience something difficult in our lives. And we use this more as a general expression when we don't really want to specify what it is. So if somebody asks you, what's wrong? You seem upset. You can just say, I'm going through a lot right now. I'm going through a lot right now. And that's just general, but it lets the person know you're experiencing something difficult. Now they might follow up and say, well, what? Tell me more. And then you can say, I lost my job. I, my car was in an accident. My mom got sick. So you can list the difficult things in your life. So we use this as a general statement. What's wrong? I'm going through a lot right now. I'm going through a lot right now. Now notice it's our verb to be. So, or sorry, not our verb to be. Our verb is go. So that's the verb you're going to conjugate. Now here it's in the past continuous. That's why we have I was going. I was going. And here it's in the present continuous. I'm going. Because you're experiencing the difficulty right now. Not that that justifies my behavior at all. So Will Smith is saying the fact he was experiencing something difficult, that's not an excuse. If something justifies something, it's an excuse. It says it's okay that I slapped him because I was going through something. But he's saying that doesn't justify it. That's not an excuse. So you can think of this as an excuse. But remember, they're using it in the negative, an excuse. Not that that justifies my behavior. It's not an excuse. Smith added that there were many nuances and complexities to it, but added, I just, I lost it. I lost it. Now notice here, I lost it. What do you think that it is. I lost it. What? What did he lose? His keys, his wallet? No. When we use this in a general sense, I lost it. And I know what the context of the story is. He slapped someone. I know that it means his sense of control over himself, his emotions, his actions. I lost it. So we... Use this in the sense, I lost it yesterday in the meeting. So maybe you were in this meeting and your coworker said she couldn't finish the project and you lost it. What do you mean you couldn't finish the project? That's unacceptable. And you get really, really angry. You lose control of your emotions, your actions. You get taken over by the emotion, maybe the bottled, the bottled emotion, your bottled anger, your bottled rage. So I lost it. This is an expression. Hopefully you don't have to use it too often because it's not a positive expression. So to lose it, this means to lose control over your emotions, your your actions as well. Because you might just start yelling at your coworker, but you didn't really want to, you feel really bad after, but in that moment, you just couldn't control it. You lost control. Smith stormed the stage at the Hollywood award ceremony after Rock made a joke about Smith's wife, Jada's shaved head. Woo, that's kind of a tongue twister. She has the hair loss condition, alopecia. Now, notice how in the article they explain what alopecia is because it's not a very common condition. They explain it's a hair loss condition. And it's a hair loss condition for women because men, <laughs> unfortunately, lose their hair. And we call that bald, to be bald, to be bald, to be bald. 
This uh, describes a man with no head hair, no head hair, right? To be bald. But we don't usually associate that with women. So there's a condition when women lose their hair is called alopecia. Now, I want to point out these apostrophe S's. In in this case, the apostrophe S is used to show possession, possession. So Smith's wife, the wife belongs to Smith, to Will Smith. And then they're saying her name, Jada. That's his wife's name, Jada. Now, but the shaved head belongs to Jada. So that's why there is an apostrophe S. The shaved head belongs to Jada. And shaved head is when you would go like this and then you get rid of all your hair. That would be a shaved head. I believe it looks like his head is shaved here. So he would go like this and then the hair is very close to his his scalp. That's a shaved head. Now, very common for men, but not that common for women. And the comedian, Chris Rock, he made a joke about Will Smith's wife's shaved head. So shaved head. We talked about what this is. Shaved head. Hurt people hurt people. I understand how shocking that was for people. He told Noah. Noah is the TV show host. Remember, he went, Will Smith went on the Daily Show with the host Trevor Noah. So Will Smith is saying this to the TV show host Noah. I understand how shocking that was for people. So shocking. This is a great adjective. Just look at my face right now. That is shocking. (gasps) What? (gasps) So when you receive news and it causes you to go, (gasps) what? You lost your job? What? (gasps) But shocking is generally used in a negative context because we might go (gasps) in more of a positive. (gasps) You just got engaged. That's amazing. (gasps) But that's more surprise, which is can be a more positive emotion, but generally shocking. When we describe something as shocking, there's a negative emotion in there. So when Will Smith slapped the comedian, imagine what the audience did. They would have gone, shocking. How shocking that was. I was gone. That was a rage that had been bottled for a really long time. So again, that emotion, it's inside and you're not letting it out. You're not expressing your emotion. So because we've seen this for a few times, we do have some common expressions. Generally, we say you shouldn't bottle your emotions. Sometimes we add the optional preposition up to create a phrasal verb to bottle up. You shouldn't bottle up your emotions, which means you shouldn't keep your emotions inside of you. You should express them. So to express your emotion is when you might say to someone, hey, you hurt my feelings today, or I felt really sad today, instead of just keeping it inside of you and not expressing it, bottling it up inside of you. He said he also understood the pain he had caused and recalled the reaction of his nine-year-old nephew that night. So Will Smith's nine-year-old nephew watched the award ceremony and saw his uncle slap someone. And the reaction is when you go, (gasps) oh! And that's the shock. That could be the reaction. Now, nephew 
This describes a boy. It's used for males and it's your sibling's child. So your sibling's child. Your sibling's male child. It has to be for a male. Now notice I have my apostrophe S because the child belongs to your sibling. And sibling is your brother or sister. Sibling is gender neutral. It can be for brother or sister. It does not matter. Sibling. But nephew is only used for the male child of your sibling. Now we have a separate word for the female child. Do you know what that is? Your sibling's female child. This is niece, niece, niece. Your sibling's female child, niece. So you might have a niece and a nephew or just a nephew or just a niece. He's the sweetest little boy, Smith said. We came home and he had stayed up late to see his uncle Will and we're sitting in my kitchen and he's on my lap and he's holding the Oscar and he's just like, why did you hit that man, Uncle Will? Oh, that's really sad. Why did you hit that man? Now, hit can be a slap. It's the same thing. So when I slap you, <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> when I slap someone, I also hit them. It's the same thing. But hit is more general. So this is also hit, but this is also called a punch. So hit is a category, and then within that category, you have a slap, you have a punch, and other forms as well. So we have, I'll just write the ones I shared. So we have slap. This is when your hand is open. I don't necessarily like teaching these violent words. Hopefully you don't use them, but I guess you'll see them on movies and stuff. Slap and then punch is when your fist is closed. Punch. It was a mess, a mess. So to describe something as a mess, this is a negative. It's saying... Well, imagine your room. You might know this from a room in your house. Your kitchen is a mess. There's things everywhere. It's the opposite of clean. So we use this to describe a situation that is the opposite of an ideal situation. That's how I would describe it. <laughs> it being the situation. So the situation, in this case, the incident at the Oscars when he slapped someone, this situation was a mess. So it's the opposite of ideal, opposite of ideal, which is a good situation, right? So I might say the meeting was a mess. The meeting was a mess, which De describes the meeting as negative. Many negative things happened, but you would have to ask me what happened because it's not clear. So it's just a general non-specific term to say that something negative happened, but you have to say why, what happened. And then, and then you could explain the client lost it when we told her, we're over budget. Remember? Remember we talked about to lose it. The client could not control her emotions or her actions. What do you mean you're over budget? This is unacceptable. And the client lost it. So the meeting was a mess. You can also use this for a room in your house, the kitchen. My kitchen is a mess. Now, in this case, it's saying it's dirty or 
not organized. That would be the definition of when you describe a room, a room as a mess, dirty or not organized. The interview on the late night US TV talk show was the first time Smith had been publicly challenged about the attack. Smith told Noah he understood the often quoted theory that hurt people hurt people. Discussing the background to his Oscars assault, the actor said it was a lot of things. It was the little boy that watched his father beat up his mother, you know, all of that just bubbled up in the moment. That's not who I want to be. So to beat someone up, this means to violently attack someone. So it has a very negative meaning, especially when we're talking about a father violently attacking a mother, right? So to violently attack. And you can do that obviously by hitting someone, slapping someone, punching someone to violently attack. Now notice it's a phrasal verb to beat up. So we have this preposition up is formed with the verb beat, which you conjugate and then you add the preposition up. Okay. To bubble up, think back to our, when our emotions were bottled up, right? They're inside. You're not expressing them. Now imagine this is a fizzy drink like Coca-Cola, or Sprite or something like that. If I shake it and that's Coke, when I open this, what's going to happen? If I shake a carbonated drink and I open it, it's going to explode. That is the meaning of bubble up. Because remember, your emotions are bottled up, but then they bubble up. They all come to the surface at once. So it's another way of saying explode. All of that just bubbled up. So you can say exploded in that moment. And notice bubble up. It's also a phrasal verb. We have our verb bubble and our preposition up. That's not who I want to be. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Will Smith. Smith has opened up before about growing up in an abusive home. So an abusive home, this is a home where you either witness violence, like he witnessed his father beat up his mother, or he also could have received violence himself. So it's possible that his father also beat him up. That is what we would describe an abusive home. Now, grow up. I find a lot of students notice or know how to use this, but often I see mistakes because they forget that it's a phrasal verb. You need the verb grow and the preposition up. So when you grow up in a home or you can grow up in a specific city, that means that is where you were raised. That's where you were a child and then you became older and older and older and became an adult. So you might say, I live in Florida now, but I grew up in Texas. So the, this means I spent most of my time when I was a child and when I was becoming an adult, that time when I grew up, I spent it in Texas. Now, remember our verb is grow. So this is in the past simple. I grew up in Texas. Don't forget that preposition up. Now, the last thing I will share with you is our phrasal verb, open up, to open up. So to open up about something is when you share information about a, 
a negative or simply a personal event in your life. So Will Smith is saying he bottled up his emotions. He kept them inside, but then eventually he decided to open up. He decided to share that information. So he, maybe he told his close friends, maybe he told some, a therapist even, or he told some family members about the abuse that he experienced as a child. So he shared that personal information. So that is another great phrasal verb. So now you have a lot of new vocabulary from this article. I am going to read this article from start to finish so you can focus on the pronunciation uninterrupted. So I'll do that now. Will Smith says bottled rage led him to slap Chris Rock at the Oscars. Will Smith has said his bottled rage led him to slap comedian Chris Rock on stage at the Oscars in March. The actor has been interviewed for the first time since the incident, which he described as a horrific night. Appearing on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, he said, I was going through something that night, you know? Not that that justifies my behavior at all. Smith added that there were many nuances and complexities to it, but added, I just, I lost it. Smith stormed the stage at the Hollywood Award Ceremony after Rock made a joke about Smith's wife Jada's shaved head. She has the hair loss condition, alopecia. Hurt people hurt people. I understand how shocking that was for people, he told Noah. I was gone. That was a rage that had been bottled for a really long time. He said he also understood the pain he had caused and recalled the reaction of his nine-year-old nephew that night. He's the sweetest little boy, Smith said. We came home and he had stayed up late to see his uncle Will. And we're sitting in the kitchen and he's on my lap and he's holding the Oscar. And he's just like, why did you hit that man, Uncle Will? It was a mess. The interview on the late night U.S. TV talk show was the first time Smith had been publicly challenged about the attack. Smith told Noah he understood the often quoted theory that hurt people hurt people. Discussing the background to his Oscars assault, the actor said, It was a lot of things. It was the little boy that watched his father beat up his mother, you know? All of that just bubbled up in that moment. That's not who I want to be. Smith has opened up before about growing up in an abusive home. Amazing job. You have already improved your vocabulary so much. So let's keep going because next you're going to learn 150 common idioms in English. And these are idioms that native speakers actually use. So you can add them to your speech to help you sound fluent, professional, and natural. Plus knowing them will also help you understand native speakers. Let's get started. To play something by ear. This is when you make a decision in the moment rather than planning in advance. So let's say you're talking about your weekend and your husband or your friend says, what do you want to do this weekend? And you might say, let's play it by ear. Let's decide as the weekend happens, not in advance. Let's play it by ear. To be all ears. We use this to say that you're ready to listen and you're paying full attention. So let's say you tell your boss you want to discuss something important about the project and your boss replies, I'm all ears, I'm all ears. To wake up on the wrong side of the bed. This is a great one. We've all done this. It's when you wake up in a bad mood. You wake up grumpy. 
So let's say you wake up, you go in the kitchen and your wife, your husband says, oh, hi, honey, how are you? Would you like some coffee? What do you want for breakfast? And you're grumpy, oh, I don't care, oh, where's my phone? And you're being grumpy, well then your wife, your husband can say, well, someone woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And that's just to let you know you're being grumpy. To wing something. When you wing something, you perform a speech or presentation without planning in advance. So you definitely don't want to wing your IELTS exam, right? To make a mountain out of a molehill. A molehill is really small, a mountain is really big. So it's when you take a minor problem or issue and you make it seem really serious or severe. So let's say you got one question wrong on a test and you're acting like it's extremely serious. Someone could say, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. They're letting you know it's really not that bad. To be at a crossroads. This is when you have to make a really important decision that could impact your life. Let's say you've been a graphic designer for 10 years, but you're considering going back to school and changing careers and becoming a lawyer or a teacher. So you might say, I'm not sure if I want to be a graphic designer anymore. I'm at a crossroads because that decision will impact your life. To rain cats and dogs, this is when it rains heavily. So let's say your friend in a different city asks you, oh, did it rain last night? And it did, it rained heavily. You can say, yeah, it rained cats and dogs. To be on top of the world, this is when you're really, really happy. So let's say you got a new promotion, you can say, I'm on top of the world. To give someone the cold shoulder. This is when you ignore someone and you ignore someone on purpose, usually because you're mad at them, annoyed with them, they did something wrong or something to irritate you. So let's say your husband or your wife is ignoring you. You might say, why are you giving me the cold shoulder? It's another way of asking, why are you mad at me? What did I do wrong? Why are you giving me the cold shoulder? To sit on the fence. This is when you delay making a decision, usually because that decision is difficult and you don't want to make it. For example, I asked my boss for a promotion, but he's sitting on the fence. So he won't answer me. He won't say yes, he won't say no. He keeps just saying, oh, I need to think about it. I'll get back to you. He's sitting on the fence. To hit the nail on the head, this is when you accurately explain a problem or a situation. For example, you hit the nail on the head when you said we needed to reduce our costs. So you explain the situation accurately. To be as fit as a fiddle. This simply means you feel great. You have good health, you're in good shape. So maybe you could say, since I changed my diet and I'm eating more fruits and vegetables, I feel as fit as a fiddle. This is a great one. To get something out of your system. This is when you do something or you try something simply so you can move on. For example, let's say you've been talking about going skydiving for years and years. You research it, you look at different websites, you talk to people about it, but you've never actually done it. Someone might say, just go skydiving so you can get it out of your system. So once you do it, you can stop researching it, stop looking it up and just move on already. I like this one. Speak of the devil. 
speak of the devil. This sounds negative because of devil, but it's not at all. This is used when you're talking about someone and they appear exactly as you're talking about them. This has happened, right? Let's say you're talking to a friend about your mutual friend, Bob, and you're talking about Bob. Oh, is Bob going to come to the party? Oh, I'm not sure, I haven't talked to Bob. And then your phone rings and guess what? It's Bob. And then you can say, speak of the devil. To give someone the benefit of the doubt, this is when you trust someone when they tell you something. So if a coworker is late and they call you and they say, I'm stuck in traffic, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's trust that he's actually stuck in traffic. No pain, no gain. This is a classic one. This is used to say that if you want results, real results, you have to be willing to work hard and get uncomfortable. So I might say, if you want to improve your public speaking skills, no pain, no gain. You have to be willing to get uncomfortable. Hang in there. This is a great one. It simply means don't give up. I know learning a language is hard, but hang in there. A penny for your thoughts? This is used to ask someone what they're thinking. So let's say your friend is just staring out the window and you probably are wondering, what are they thinking about? You can turn to your friend and say, a penny for your thoughts? It's not rocket science. Rocket science is complicated, right? But if we say it's not rocket science, this means it's not complicated. So I could say becoming a confident English speaker is not rocket science, it's not complicated, you just have to practice speaking. To let someone off the hook. This is a great one because it means that you don't punish someone for a mistake or a wrongdoing. So your boss could say, I know you came in late today, but I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to punish you. To make a long story short, this is when you take a long and usually complicated story and you make it very simple by sharing it briefly. So you could say, long story short, we missed our flight. So there's a long story about why you missed your flight, but you don't explain those details. You just say, long story short, we missed our flight. Easy does it, easy does it. This is a way of saying slow down. So if your friend is at the gym and they're trying to do too many exercises with too much weight, you might say, easy does it, slow down. To go back to the drawing board. This is when you need to start over and create a new plan or strategy because the first one failed. So let's say you were trying to solve a computer problem, you came up with a strategy, it didn't work, and then you can say to your team, well, let's go back to the drawing board and try again. Once in a blue moon. This is an event that happens infrequently. For example, I only see Kara once in a blue moon, not very often. At the drop of a hat. This is a great one because it means without hesitation or instantly. For example, Call me if you need anything and I'll be there at the drop of a hat. It means I'll come instantly if you need anything. So it's a really nice reassuring thing to say to someone. To add insult to injury. This is when you take a bad situation and it becomes even worse. So let's say you're going out on a first date and your date showed up late. That's already a bad situation. But then to add insult to injury, your date forgot his wallet and you had to pay for both of you. To hit the sack, this means to go to bed. For example, I'm really tired, I'm going to hit the sack. The ball's in your court. 
This is used when you need to make the next decision or the next step. So I might say, we offered her a great promotion, so now the ball's in her court. So it's up to her to decide if she's going to accept the promotion or look for another job or do something else. To be or to go barking up the wrong tree. This is when you look in the wrong place or you accuse the wrong person. For example, if you think I lost your ring, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're accusing the wrong person. To get or to have your ducks in a row. This is when you're well prepared or well organized for something specific. So you might say, the conference was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. They should have gotten their ducks in a row. They should have been organized or prepared. To get or have the best of both worlds. This is when you enjoy the advantages of two very different things at the same time. She works in the city, but she lives in the country. She gets the best of both worlds. The lion's share. This is the largest part or most of something. So you might complain, I did the lion's share of work on this project. To be on the ball. This is when you're performing really well. Wow, you completed all those reports already? You're on the ball. To pull someone's leg. This is when you're joking with someone. So we usually use this to reassure someone you're only joking. Don't get upset, I'm just pulling your leg. To pull yourself together. This is when you need to calm down. You regain your composure after being really upset or agitated, angry, annoyed, and then you calm down. So I might say, pull yourself together. It was a false alarm. So the alarm made you really agitated and I'm telling you to calm down. So far, so good. This is how you reply when you want to let someone know that everything is okay until now. How's the project going? So far, so good. To be the last straw. This is when you have no patience left for someone's errors or mistakes. So I might say, this is her fifth time being late this month. That's the last straw. No more patience for her mistakes. Time flies when you're having fun. This is used to say that you don't notice how long something takes because it's enjoyable. So you might look at your watch and say, oh wow, it's 1 a.m. already? And then someone could reply and say, yeah, time flies when you're having fun. To be bent out of shape, this is used to say, you're upset, you're angry. For example, Janice is bent out of shape because she has to work late tonight. To make matters worse. Matters in this sense means problems, to make problems worse. So I might say, I have to work tonight. And to make matters worse, to make that situation even worse, I have an early appointment tomorrow. Don't judge a book by its cover. You've probably heard this one. It means that you shouldn't judge someone or something on appearance. For example, let's say I'm hiring people and I say I'm not going to hire him. Look at his hair. <laughs> and then my colleague would say, well, don't judge a book by its cover. Look at his resume. To fall between two stools. This is when something fails to achieve two separate objectives. So let's say you plan to watch a romantic comedy movie. That movie is supposed to be romantic and funny at the same time. A romantic comedy, two objectives. So you could say that movie 
fell between two stools. It wasn't romantic and it wasn't funny. To cost an arm and a leg. This is when something is exceptionally expensive. Now, airline tickets are usually expensive, but exceptionally expensive, even more expensive than usual. I might say my flight cost an arm and a leg. To cross a bridge when you come to it. This is used to remind someone that you only need to deal with the situation when it happens. So your friend might be concerned, what if I forget all my words during my IELTS speaking exam? And then you tell that friend, cross that bridge when you come to it. Worry about that problem when it happens. To cry over spilt milk. This is used when someone complains about a problem or a loss from the past. So let's say I had a party weeks ago and now I'm complaining, I can't believe John didn't come to my party. Well, my friend can say, don't cry over spilled milk. It was three weeks ago. Why are you still talking about it? Curiosity killed the cat. This is used to say that being inquisitive or asking a lot of questions can lead to an unpleasant situation. So let's say your husband or wife is planning you a surprise birthday party and you try to ask a lot of questions. What are we doing? Where are we going? Who's coming? Then your husband or wife can say, curiosity killed the cat, just to remind you don't ask so many questions. To miss the boat. This is when you lose an opportunity because you were too slow to take action. For example, the application deadline was last week. I missed the boat. To be on fire. This is to perform really well. Wow, your presentation was amazing. You were on fire. To spill the beans, this is when you reveal a secret when you shouldn't have revealed a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for someone and then you tell everyone, don't spill the beans, don't reveal the secret. To be under the weather, this is when you feel unwell, when you feel sick. Oh. I'm a little under the weather today. A blessing in disguise. This is when something, a situation seems bad or unlucky at first, but it results in something positive at a later date. So let's say you get fired from your job. Obviously that seems bad, maybe even unlucky. But later on, you get a job 10 times better. It pays better, you have a better boss, better coworkers, the location is better. Everything about this job is better. You can say, getting fired was a blessing in disguise. My new job is so much better. A dime a dozen. This is used to describe something that is common and not special. So you can say tech startups in Silicon Valley are a dime a dozen. They're very common, they're everywhere, and they're not very special. Everyone's a tech startup in Silicon Valley, a dime a dozen. To beat around the bush. This is when you avoid saying what you mean because it's uncomfortable or awkward. So let's say you want to end your romantic relationship with your partner. Your friend could tell you, don't beat around the bush. Be direct and tell that person you want to break up. Better late than never. So let's say you've been working with a company for 10 years and you finally got your first promotion after 10 years and you're telling your friend this and you're a little 
annoyed because you've been there for 10 years. But your friend could say, better late than never, to remind you that, yes, it took 10 years, but it's better than not having a promotion. Better late than never. To bite the bullet. I love this idiom. This is when you force yourself to do something difficult or unpleasant because it's necessary or inevitable. Inevitable means eventually you have to do it, so why not bite the bullet and do it now? For example, just bite the bullet and ask your boss for a promotion. Break a leg. This is a very common idiom that we use to say good luck. Good luck, break a leg. But we especially use this before someone gives a performance. Most commonly a theatrical performance, but when you're going for a job interview, you are in a sense performing. Or when you're doing your speaking exam for your IELTS, you are performing. So before your speaking exam, your friend, your partner could say, break a leg, which means good luck. To call it a day. When you call it a day, it means you stop working for that day, usually because time is up or because you've done enough work for that day and you're going to stop. For example, it's getting late, let's call it a day. Let's call it a day. So that means you can go home. To cut somebody some slack. So let's say there's this coworker who has been showing up late to work every day and not doing a very good job at work. They seem very distracted. They're not working very hard. They're not contributing. But that person's dad just died. So you might say, let's cut him some slack. His dad just died. So you're not going to punish him as severely as you normally would. To be glad to see the back of. This means that you're happy that somebody has left because you don't like them. So let's say it's Jane's last day at work. She quit, she has a new job, but you didn't like Jane. You can say, I'm glad to see the back of Jane. To be the best thing since sliced bread. This is a compliment used to say that something, usually technology or an invention, is extremely useful, excellent, or high quality. So you could give me a compliment and say, this YouTube channel is the best thing since sliced bread. If you think that's true, then put it in the comments. There are plenty of fish in the sea. So let's say your friend went on a date and she says, Pierre hasn't called me back and it's been three weeks. You can encourage your friend by saying, don't worry, there are plenty of fish in the sea. Come rain or shine. This is used to say that an event will take place despite external circumstances. So let's say tomorrow is a vacation day for you, but there's a big project deadline tomorrow. But you might say, I'm taking the day off tomorrow, come rain or shine, to cut corners. This is when you do something in the cheapest, easiest, or fastest way, but by omitting something or by not following rules. So you might say, we felt pressured to cut corners because of the tight deadline to get your act together. 
So your parents might say to you or your sibling or someone you know, you're 30 and you still live at home and you don't have a job. You need to get your act together. You need to organize yourself so you can live in, e in an effective and efficient way. Get your act together to break the ice. This is such an important one because this is used to help people who don't know each other to feel more comfortable around each other, especially when they're meeting for the first time. Let's break the ice by introducing ourselves and sharing something interesting about ourselves. Clear as mud. This is used to say that something is very difficult to understand. So if somebody gave you instructions, but their instructions didn't make any sense at all, and they ask you, so is everything okay? Do you understand? You can say clear as mud, which tells the person you do not understand at all. Crystal clear, something is very clear and easy to understand. His instructions were crystal clear. To rock the boat. This is when you do or say something that could upset people or cause problems. Don't rock the boat until the negotiations are done. So don't say anything that could upset someone or that could cause problems until we sign the deal. And then you can cause problems if you want to. To get out of hand, this is another way of saying to get out of control, which means you no longer have control over a situation. You could say the party got out of hand, which means you were no longer able to control it. The party got out of hand and some valuables were broken. A bad apple. This is used to describe a bad or corrupt person within a group. You could say, there are a few bad apples in the company. To cut to the chase. This is when you only talk about the most important points of a subject or topic. So if you're running out of time in, the, in a meeting, you might say, we're running out of time, so I'll cut to the chase. I'll only say the most important points. To come in handy. This is used when something is very useful for a specific purpose. So if it's pouring rain outside, you might say an umbrella would come in handy. An umbrella would be very useful in this particular situation. To reinvent the wheel. This is when you waste time trying to recreate something that somebody else has already created. So let's say you ask your boss, should I create a presentation for the conference? And your boss suggests using last year's presentation. It's already created. And your boss can add, don't reinvent the wheel. So we often use this idiom in the negative. To go with the flow. When you go with the flow, it means that you do what other people are doing or you agree with the opinion of others, the majority. So let's say you're having a company dinner and you originally wanted to have burgers, but the majority of people say they want pizza. So you can go with the flow and have pizza instead of burgers because that's what the majority wants. To be skating on thin ice. This is when you do something that is dangerous or involves risk. He's skating on thin ice by lying to his wife. It involves risk. It's dangerous. Don't do it. A silver lining. This is something positive that comes from something negative. So the pandemic is negative, right? But is there anything positive, a silver lining? Maybe we could say 
One silver lining of the pandemic is that it made us realize how important our relationships are with friends and family. To have a sweet tooth. This is somebody who likes eating sweet foods, especially chocolate. So if people offer me dessert, generally I'll say no because I don't like sweet food. So I could say, no thank you, I don't have a sweet tooth, which means I don't really like sweet foods. To go Dutch. This is when you agree to share the cost of something, especially a meal. So let's say you're having dinner with a friend, family member, even a romantic partner, and they say, I'll pay for the meal. You could say, no, 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 let's go Dutch, which means you're going to divide the cost 50-50. To make ends meet. This is when you have just enough money to pay for essential items. You might say, with food prices increasing, we're barely making ends meet. To ring a bell. This is when something, usually a person, a place, or information is familiar to you. So let's say you're having a conversation with a coworker and they say, oh, have you met Fred from accounting? And you're thinking, Fred, Fred, Fred from accounting? That doesn't ring a bell. The tip of the iceberg. This is used to describe a small part of a much bigger problem. These small local protests are just the tip of the iceberg to blow off steam. This is when you say or do something that helps you release strong feelings or strong energy, strong emotion. After our fight, I went for a walk to blow off steam. So when you were on that walk, you were able to calm down, to release that negative energy. A piece of cake. This is something that was extremely easy. That exam was a piece of cake. To be out of the woods. This is when you no longer have a problem or difficulty. Our profits are increasing, but we're not out of the woods yet. To get over something. This is when you recover from an illness. It took me two weeks to get over that cold. To not be one's cup of tea. This is used to describe a type or category that you don't like. Thanks for the invite, but camping isn't my cup of tea. I don't like that category of activity. To be loaded. This means to be rich, to have a lot of money. I just found out my cousin's loaded. To nip something in the bud. This is to stop something before it has an opportunity to become established. We need to nip these rumors in the bud before the employees start worrying. Out of the blue. When something happens out of the blue, it happens suddenly and you weren't expecting it. My boss gave me a promotion out of the blue. You weren't expecting it. How awesome is that? To keep one's chin up. This is to remain cheerful in a difficult situation because in difficult situations, we tend to put our chin down, but when we're happy, we tend to keep our chin up. For example, I know the economy seems bad, but keep your chin up. To race against the clock. This is when you try to finish a task quickly before a specific time. I raced against the clock to finish the audit and meet the deadline. To catch somebody off guard. This is when you surprise somebody by doing something they weren't expecting or weren't prepared for. The politician was caught off guard when asked about the scandal. To be on one's radar. If something is on your radar, it means you're considering it or thinking about it or aware of it. 
You could say leaving the company isn't on my radar. It's not even something I'm considering. To stab someone in the back. This is to betray someone, to do something harmful to someone who trusted you. She told the client she did all the work on the project. I can't believe she stabbed me in the back like that. To make a beeline for something. This is when you move quickly and directly towards something. So let's say you're at a wedding or a conference and they're about to serve lunch, the buffet lunch. Everyone made a beeline for the food. They went quickly and directly to the food. To be in hot water. This is when you're in a situation where you might be criticized or punished. The politician's in hot water after his comments on gender equality. To be dressed to the nines. This is when you're dressed formally, smartly, or fashionably. We dress to the nines for our wedding anniversary. So you usually dress to the nines for a special occasion. To be between a rock and a hard place. This is when you're in a difficult situation or you have to make a difficult decision. If I accept the promotion, then I'll have to move abroad. And I know Matt, my partner, won't come with me. So I either accept the promotion that I really want, but then I have to lose Matt, or I stay with Matt and I don't get the promotion. Hmm. I'm between a rock and a hard place. It's a difficult situation. It's a difficult decision. Lo and behold, this is an expression used to say that something surprising happened. I was on vacation in Japan and lo and behold, I saw my childhood sweetheart. So it's very surprising that I see my childhood sweetheart across the world in a foreign city. Lo and behold, to let the cat out of the bag. This is when you accidentally reveal a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for your wife or husband or friend and they know about it. You might say, you know about the party, don't you? Who let the cat out of the bag? Who told you? Who revealed the secret? Who let the cat out of the bag? To be on the same page. This is used when all people agree on something and that something is generally a plan or how to approach something. For example, before we launch the product, we need to get everybody on the same page. So we need to make sure that all the different people agree on the plan to launch the product. To sell like hotcakes. I love this idiom. This is used when something sells very quickly, easily, or in large quantities, large amounts. For example, her new book sold like hotcakes. So this is a very good idiom. To fall through the cracks or to slip through the cracks. This is used when something is not noticed or something does not have sufficient attention. And remember, you can use two different verbs, fall or through, and both have the same meaning and they're both very common. For example, I'm sorry I forgot to send you the report. It slipped through the cracks. It fell through the cracks. So I just didn't notice it. I didn't pay enough attention to it. To be up in arms. This is a great one as well because we use it when someone is grumpy or angry about something specific. For example, Julie is up in arms because we have to stay late tonight. So Julie is angry or grumpy because of something specific. We have to stay late tonight. She's up in arms. Fair and square. This means honestly or according to the rules. So let's say my team lost a competition, but 
we deserve to lose. The other team played better than us. I can say they beat us fair and square. Honestly, according to the rules, they won fair and square. To be a black sheep. This is when a member of a group is different from the other members. And we often use this with family. For example, all my cousins are married and have kids, except Tom. Tom is the black sheep. He's different from all the other members of the group, in this case, family. By the skin of one's teeth. This means barely or by a very slight margin. We won by the skin of our teeth. So we won by only by this much, not very much. To get under one's skin. And this is to irritate or upset someone. For example, I don't know why, but Jerry really gets under my skin. Jerry really irritates me, he upsets me. To draw the line. This is when you put a limit on what you will allow or what you will do. For example, I want to help my sister, but I draw the line at lending her money. So that is what I will not do. I will not lend her money. That is not allowed. To give something a whirl. This is a fun one. It simply means to try something new. For example, you should give bowling a whirl. It's really fun. So if I know you've never gone bowling before, I could say you should try it. You should give it a whirl. To be a fish out of water. This is used to say that someone is in an unfamiliar and uncomfortable surrounding. For example, I feel like a fish out of water when I go to English meetings because you have to speak in English and that's unfamiliar and uncomfortable. You feel like a fish out of water. To go the extra mile. This is when you make an extra attempt to achieve something or do something. For example, she's a great assistant. She always goes the extra mile. So she does more than she needs to. To not see the forest from the trees. This is a very popular one. This is when you're so involved in the small minor details of something that you don't see the bigger picture. You don't see the forest from the individual trees. For example, the project failed because we couldn't see the forest from the trees. We lost track of the bigger picture. Straight from the horse's mouth. This is when you get information directly from the source of that information. I heard straight from the horse's mouth that we're not getting bonuses this year. To cry wolf. This is when you call for help but you don't actually need help. So in the future, nobody will assist you because you lied about needing help. For example, I'm not surprised nobody responded to her email. She always cries wolf. So she always asks for help when she doesn't need it. But then one day she does need help, but nobody will help her because she cries wolf. To have bigger fish to fry. This is when you have other, more important matters to deal with. For example, can you attend my meeting this afternoon? I have bigger fish to fry. So I have a meeting that's dealing with more important things than this other meeting. To play devil's advocate. This is when you argue against something, even if you think the opposite, simply to address all sides of a situation. For example, it would be great to get a promotion, but to play devil's advocate, it would mean longer hours. 
So you actually want the promotion, but you're going to examine the other side just to be complete. To steal one's thunder. This is a very popular one. This is to prevent someone from getting the recognition, praise, or success that they deserve. And you do that by saying exactly what that person was going to say. For example, she announced her engagement at my engagement party. She stole my thunder. So I should have received the praise, the congratulations at my engagement party. But she announced her engagement, so now everybody is congratulating her. She stole my thunder. To rain on one's parade. This is to spoil someone's pleasure or special moment. Let's say, my friend is very happy because she got an A on the exam. I could say, I hate to rain on your parade, but everyone got an A. So I'm spoiling her pleasure by saying that everybody got the exact same grade. To be a cakewalk, a cakewalk. This is when something is very easy or effortless. For example, learning English is a cakewalk, right? Would you agree? To take a rain check. This is when you decline an invitation by suggesting you'll accept that invitation at a future time. So not now, but later. Let's say somebody invites me to lunch today, but I'm very busy. I could say, I'd love to have lunch, but I need to take a rain check, which means not today, but later. To go on a wild goose chase or to be on a wild goose chase. You can use either verbs, go or be. This is when you're looking for something specific but it's a complete waste of time because that something specific doesn't exist. For example, after hiking for five hours, we realized we were on a wild goose chase because the waterfall doesn't exist. So we were looking for a specific waterfall, but on the trail we were on, there is no waterfall. The waterfall is at a completely different location. So we were on a wild goose chase because we're looking for something that doesn't exist. To twist someone's arm. This is when you persuade someone to do something that they don't want to do. For example, I didn't want to go to the party, but Sarah twisted my arm. So Sarah persuaded me, convinced me to go to the party. To face the music. This is when you accept criticism or punishment for something you did do. For example, I missed the deadline, so now it's time to face the music. Now I have to meet with my boss. We both know I missed the deadline. It was wrong, so I am going to be punished and I deserve it. It's time to face the music. To hit the books. This means to study or do homework. For example, I can't go to the party tonight. I need to hit the books. To turn a deaf ear. This is when you ignore someone when they complain or they ask for help. For example, I asked Maria to extend the deadline, but she turned a deaf ear. So when I asked her to extend the deadline, I was asking her to help me, but she ignored me. She turned a deaf ear. To break the bank. This means to cause financial ruin. For example, this vacation costs $5,000. It's expensive, but it won't break the bank. It won't cause financial ruin. To jump the gun. 
This is when you do something too soon without thinking about it carefully. For example, the company jumped the gun when they canceled the conference. So they made that decision too soon. They should have thought about it more, took more time and then decided. To read between the lines. This is when you try to understand somebody's real feelings or intentions based on what they said or they wrote. For example, she said she's happy, but if you read between the lines, it's obvious she's upset. So you try to interpret what she's saying to really understand how she feels. Through thick and thin. This is when you support someone or stay with someone, even when there are problems or difficulties. For example, a true friend will be there through thick and thin. If there are problems or difficulties, a true friend will be there. To go back to square one. This is to start working on a plan from the beginning because your previous attempt failed. For example, the board didn't approve our plan so we have to go back to square one. We have to start again from the beginning, from scratch. This is from the very beginning. For example, I started this YouTube channel. For example, my family started this business from scratch. So when we started, there was nothing. We did everything ourselves from scratch. To shoot oneself in the foot. This is when you say or do something that could cause problems for you. For example, I shot myself in the foot when I agreed to stay late tonight. So I said yes when my boss asked me to stay late, but it's my cousin's birthday. So now I can't go to their party or I'm going to be late and I'm going to be in trouble. I shot myself in the foot. Right off the bat. This means at the very beginning or immediately. For example, you can't expect to feel confident speaking right off the bat. So immediately, at the very beginning, when you first start, that's right off the bat. You can't expect to feel confident right off the bat. In the bag. This is when something is certain to be won, achieved, or obtained. For example, Jane has the promotion in the bag. So even though they haven't formally announced that Jane has the promotion, it's certain that it's hers. She has it in the bag. Hot air. This is a great one. This is when something is not sincere and will not have practical results. For example, the advertisement claimed I would lose 20 pounds in 20 days, but it was hot air. It was not true to follow in someone's footsteps. This is when you do the same thing that someone else previously did. And that someone else is usually a family member, a friend, or a mentor. For example, she followed in her father's footsteps and became an engineer. This means that her father is also an engineer. To call a spade, a spade. This is when you tell the truth about something, even if the truth is not pleasant and not polite. For example, let's call a spade a spade. This company discriminates against women. So that's not a very polite thing to say, but it's the truth. To be in the same boat. This is when you're in the same situation as someone else, and that situation is difficult. For example, we both lost money in the stock market. We're in the same boat. To pick someone's brain. This is when 
someone has a lot of information on a subject or topic and you ask them to share that information or you ask them for their opinion. You pick their brain. For example, I'd love to buy you coffee and pick your brain sometime, which means I'd love to buy you coffee and find out what you know, ask you questions about what you know, or get your opinion on a specific topic based on your knowledge. To bounce an idea off someone. This is when you share an idea to get feedback on that idea. For example, can I bounce a few ideas off you before the meeting today? The devil's in the details. This is used when something seems simple, but the details are complicated and could cause problems. For example, the contract is only one page, which seems simple, but the devil's in the details. So in that one page, there's a lot of complicated information that could cause problems. The pot calling the kettle black. This is used to say that someone shouldn't criticize someone else for a fault that they have in themselves. Let's say Jack is always late and I get to our meeting five minutes late and Jack gets mad at me for being late, but he's always late. So I could say, I can't believe Jack was mad because I was five minutes late. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. To take a back seat. This is when you choose to not have responsibility in a organization or an activity. For example, my team is organizing a conference, but I'm taking a back seat. I'm not going to be responsible for the conference. To be up for grabs. This is a great one. It's used when something is available and ready to be won or taken. For example, do you know if Sue's office is up for grabs? So Sue's office is now empty. Maybe she left the company or she changed offices. So is her office ready and available? Is it up for grabs? To put something on ice. This is when you delay something or you reserve something for future use. Let's put the conference on ice until the summer. To bite off more than you can chew. This is when you try to do something that is too difficult for you. For example, we took on three projects this month. I think we bit off more than we can chew. So three projects is too difficult for us. To throw caution to the wind. This is when you do something without worrying about the risk or the negative consequences. For example, I wasn't happy at my job, so I threw caution to the wind and I quit. So I didn't think about the negative consequences when I made that decision. I threw caution to the wind. A cross to bear. This is an unpleasant or painful situation or person that you have to accept, even though it's very difficult for you to do so. For example, I lost our company's biggest client, and that's my cross to bear. So that's a very painful situation, knowing that I was personally responsible for this loss, but that's my cross to bear. I have to accept it and deal with that, even though it is painful. And finally, to keep one's eye on something or someone. This is when you watch something or you take care of something or someone. For example, will you keep an eye on the project while I'm at the conference? Will you take care of the project? Will you watch the project while I'm at the conference?
You have done such a great job expanding your vocabulary. Now let's keep going, but we'll do something completely different because we're going to test your listening skills, but at the same time, you're going to improve your vocabulary because you're going to learn common expressions, phrasal verbs, idioms, and advanced vocabulary that native speakers use. Let's get started. Here are your instructions for the entire lesson. I am going to say a sentence three times. You need to listen to that sentence and write down exactly what you hear in the comments. After, I'll explain what I said and you can learn the pronunciation changes that take place in fast English and you can also learn the advanced expressions that I use and that native speakers commonly use. So let's get started with the first listening exercise. I'll say it three times. We should have had a backup plan. We should have had a backup plan. We should have had a backup plan. I said we should have had a backup plan. Let's talk about the pronunciation. Notice I said we should have. We should have had. Should have. Native speakers, we combine this to sound like shoulda, shoulda. Notice that L is silent, shoulda, shoulda. We shoulda, we shoulda had, should have had, we shoulda had a backup plan. Let's take a look at the linking between back up. This is how native speakers combine sounds, so two separate words will sound like one word. Ba cup. Ba cup. So we take the sound from back, the last sound, and we transfer it to the next sound, up. Ba cup. But you have to combine those sounds together so it sounds like one word. Ba cup. Ba cup. Backup plan, backup plan. We should have had a backup plan. Now, what is a backup plan? A backup plan is an alternative plan that you can use if your original plan fails. Let's say you're going to present at a conference or a meeting. So you bring your computer and your presentation is on the computer. That's your original plan, that's plan A. But it's always smart to have a backup plan. This could be your backup plan. You can put your presentation on a USB, a memory stick, so if there's any issues with your computer, you have a plan B, a backup plan. And then you can say, my computer wouldn't connect to their equipment, but thankfully, I had my presentation on a USB. Thankfully, I had a backup plan. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. Her comment really pissed me off. Her comment really pissed me off. Her comment really pissed me off. I said her comment really pissed me off. Let's look at the pronunciation of pissed because here this is an ED, a past simple verb, but the sound of that ED is a very soft T, pissed, pissed. Now when we say this in a sentence and there are words that come after, you almost don't hear that T. So you can't really distinguish that it's in the past simple. It's the context of the sentence that will make it obvious that it is the past. Her comment really pissed me off. Now what does this mean? To piss someone off? This means to make someone really angry. Now note that this is an informal expression and it can also be considered impolite. It would be considered impolite if your name is Mark and I said, Mark, you're really pissing me off. That would be impolite. 
but native speakers commonly use this to complain about people. So I could be talking to my husband or my best friend and say, Mark really pissed me off today. In that context, it's not impolite, but it would be impolite to look directly at someone and say, you really piss me off. So don't do that. Now we also use this in the structure to be pissed off. The pronunciation is the same, pissed off, to be pissed off. This is simply to be really angry. For example, I was so pissed off when I came home to a completely dirty house, even though my kids promised to clean up after the party. Do you want to do another listening exercise? I'll say it three times. Take what she says with a grain of salt. Take what she says with a grain of salt. Take what she says with a grain of salt. I said, take what she says with a grain of salt. Here, the pronunciation is clear, but if you don't know what this idiom means, then you won't understand it. So the idiom is to take something with a grain of salt. We use this to say that you shouldn't believe everything someone tells you because it might not be true. So let's say your friend tells you that, oh, Gina says she'll help me move this weekend. But from your experience, Gina likes to make a lot of promises, but she doesn't always follow up with those promises. She doesn't always fulfill those promises. Then you might say, take what she says with a grain of salt. You're letting your friend know that Gina might not actually do what she says. And let's focus on the grammar here. What do you notice about this sentence? Take what she says with a grain of salt. What verb tense is this in? We're using the imperative. Take is in the imperative because the sentence begins with a base verb. There's no subject here. That's how you can identify the imperative. And the imperative is used to give instructions, orders, or suggestions. So I'm suggesting that my friend take what she says with a grain of salt. Your next listening exercise, I'll say it three times. It's high time we let her go. It's high time we let her go. It's high time we let her go. I said, it's high time we let her go. For pronunciation, let's talk about let her go. Let her go. Here, notice how her sounds like er. You don't hear the H, er. But I also attach it to the word before, so I link those sounds together. Letter, 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 let her go, let her go. It's high time we let her go. Let's look at the expression, it's high time. When you say it's high time that something should happen, you're saying that something should happen now and not later. And when you use this expression, you also suggest that it should have already happened. So we should have, we shoulda, already let her go. But we didn't, so we should do it now because it's high time we let her go. And in my opinion, it's high time that you enrolled in the Finally Fluent Academy. It's high time. You should have already done this. You should have already done this, but maybe you haven't, so you should do it now and not later. What's the Finally Fluent Academy? Well, this is my premium training program where we study native English speakers on TV, movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English and add the most common expressions to your speech. So we do exactly what you're doing now, but you use 
native speakers from TV, movies, YouTube, so you get a variety of different accents and styles of speech. Plus, you'll have me as your teacher, and I'll be there to coach you every step of the way. So it's high time you join the Finally Fluent Academy, and you can look for the link in the description to learn more. Coming back to our example, it's high time you let her go. Now, to let someone go, this is an alternative way of saying to fire someone. When you fire someone, they permanently stop working for the company. So when you let someone go, they permanently stop working for the company. It's high time we let her go. Remember, you're suggesting you should have let her go a while ago. So now you better do it. Let's do one last listening exercise. I'll say it three times. He looked a little frazzled. He looked a little frazzled. He looked a little frazzled. I said he looked a little frazzled. Let's talk about pronunciation. A little, little. Native speakers, we don't pronounce T's between two vowels. It will be either a very soft D, little, d, d, little, d, or you just won't hear it, lil, lil, a lil, a little. And notice the a uh is connected to it, a lil, a lil, a little. He looked a little frazzled. Frazzled, here it's a past simple ed verb, but the pronunciation is a very soft d, and you almost don't hear it. Frazzled, d, 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 very soft, frazzled, frazzled. To be frazzled or to look frazzled, this is when you are or look very tired, but you also look very worried or anxious. So I might look frazzled if you see me, and normally my hair is nice and in a nice position, but you see me and my hair is crazy, I have makeup a little bit under my eyes, maybe my shirt is a little messy as well, and visibly you can see that I might look frazzled. And then obviously I'll look very tired and maybe like very worried and anxious. So you might see it visibly in my appearance and you can see it on my facial expression as well. So if you see a coworker that looks frazzled, you might say, are you okay? You look a little frazzled. Amazing job improving your listening skills of fast English. Now let's improve your pronunciation. Let's do an imitation exercise. I'm going to say each sentence again but I'm going to pause and then I want you to repeat the sentence out loud and try to follow my pronunciation exactly. So try to imitate my pronunciation. And I'll say each sentence three times, so I want you to repeat it out loud three times. We should have had a backup plan. We should have had a backup plan. We should have had a backup plan. Her comment really pissed me off. Her comment really pissed me off. Her comment really pissed me off. Take what she says with a grain of salt. Take what she says with a grain of salt. Take what she says with a grain of salt. It's high time we let her go. It's high time we let her go. It's high time we let her go. He looked a little frazzled. He looked a little frazzled. He looked a little frazzled. Are you ready? All right, let's go. So I'll say it three times. My mom nitpicks like crazy. 
My mom nitpicks like crazy. My mom nitpicks like crazy. Did you get this one? I said my mom nitpicks like crazy. The pronunciation is clear, but if you don't know what the vocabulary means, you're not going to understand what that native speaker said. Here, our verb is to nitpick. To nitpick. What does this mean? This is when you find faults. Faults are things that you don't like or criticisms. When you find faults, in details that are not important. I'm sure you know someone in your life who nitpicks, or maybe you nitpick yourself. Let's say you're with someone and you go out for dinner, and the food is great, the restaurant is beautiful, the server is very friendly, but your friend finds faults in details that are not important. Your friend nitpicks. You could say, the dinner was amazing, but of course, Lindsay wasn't happy about the color of the plates or the art on the walls. Lindsay is a nitpicker. So your friend wasn't happy about the color of the plates, that is such a detail that is not important. So this is a perfect example of someone who nitpicks. But notice in my example, I said Lindsay is a nitpicker. A nitpicker. This is the noun form and a nitpicker is simply someone who nitpicks. The original example was my mom nitpicks like crazy. Here, like crazy, this simply means a lot or quickly. But in this context, it means a lot. So my mom nitpicks like crazy. My mom nitpicks a lot. You could also say, I worked like crazy all weekend. So you worked a lot all weekend. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. It's okay to be picky sometimes. It's okay to be picky sometimes. It's okay to be picky sometimes. Did you get this one? I said, it's okay to be picky sometimes. For pronunciation, notice I use the contraction it's, it's. This is the contraction of it is, it's okay. It's okay to be. But I didn't say it's okay to be picky. I said to be, to be. So an unstressed to. It's okay to be, to be, to be picky. It's okay to be picky. Now don't confuse this expression to be picky with our last expression to nitpick. Yes, they both use the word pick, but they are totally different expressions. This expression, to be picky, this describes someone who has very strong preferences about what they like and don't like. For example, most young kids are picky. I don't know about you, but when I was a young kid, five years old, 10 years old, there were many food items that I did not eat. My diet was very simple. I had a small number of things that I liked to eat, and I had a very large number of things that I did not like to eat. So as a child, I was picky when it came to food, when it came to eating. What about you? Were you a picky eater? Were you picky about your food when you were a child? Or maybe you still are right now. Some adults are picky as well. In our original example, I said, it's okay to be picky sometimes. It's okay, that means it is acceptable. It's acceptable to be picky, to have those strong preferences about what you like and don't like, 
sometimes. For example, it's okay to be picky when it comes to a job, choosing a job. You should have very strong preferences about what you want that job to have, the qualities of that job, and that's okay. Choosing a job, choosing a house, you should definitely be picky, have very strong preferences. And choosing a spouse, maybe that's the ultimate one. You should be very picky when you choose a spouse because you're with that person for your entire life. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. I'm B, let's call it a day. I'm B, let's call it a day. I'm B, let's call it a day. Did you get this one? I said, I'm beat. Let's call it a day. Let's talk about the contraction at the beginning. I'm, of course, this is I am. I'm, I'm beat. I'm beat. I'm beat. Let's call it. But with linking, we're going to combine those sounds so it sounds like call it. Call it. So call lit, but then we have to say it as one word, call it, call it, call it a day, call it a day, call it a day. I'm beat, let's call it a day. To be beat, I'm beat, this means to be very tired, to be exhausted. So instead of saying I'm very tired, you can say I'm beat, I'm beat, we're beat, the verb to be. Now let's talk about the expression, let's call it a day. To call it a day, this is an expression used to say that you're going to stop working for the day. And you stop working for the day because you've completed enough work, you've done what you've needed to do, or simply because everyone is exhausted Everyone is beat and it isn't productive anymore to keep working. So maybe it's three o'clock and technically the day ends at five o'clock, but everyone is so tired, everyone is beat that they're just not thinking clearly anymore. So you might say, let's call it a day. Let's just stop working for today and we'll get a good night's sleep, we'll come back tomorrow and begin again. You could combine this with our expression like crazy, which means a lot, and you could say, we've been working like crazy all week, let's call it a day. So again, maybe it's Friday at two o'clock and technically you're supposed to work until five, but because you've been working like crazy all week, Let's just call it a day and stop working now. Are you ready for another listening exercise? I'll say it three times. You shouldn't be so nosy. You shouldn't be so nosy. You shouldn't be so nosy. Did you get this one? I said, you shouldn't be so nosy. Here, notice I said shouldn't shouldn't, you shouldn't be. This is a contraction of should not, shouldn't. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be so nosy. What does this mean? To be nosy, to be nosy. This is used to say that you're interested in what other people are doing or saying when you have no right to be interested in that. You have no right to know what other people are saying or doing because it doesn't involve you. A lot of people are nosy when it comes to their significant other's cell phone. They want to know what their significant other is looking at online, who they're talking to, who they're texting with, but ultimately you have no right to that knowledge because that's your significant other's personal privacy. So if your significant other leaves their phone 
and goes to the bathroom or goes to another room and you pick up the phone and you try to look at it without them knowing you are being nosy. And that's when someone can say, you shouldn't be so nosy. Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. Being nosy is one of my pet peeves. Being nosy is one of my pet peeves. Being nosy is one of my pet peeves. Did you get this one? I said, being nosy is one of my pet peeves. And now you know what nosy means, so I don't have to explain that. Being nosy. Notice how this is a gerund statement. A sentence that starts with a gerund verb, a verb in ing. Being nosy. Gerund statements are used to make general statements. So in general, being nosy is one of my pet peeves. What is a pet peeve? A pet peeve is something that especially annoys you. So there are many things that annoy you, but a pet peeve is when, whenever that one thing happens, it really annoys you. So I Googled this and according to Google, the top three pet peeves, things that especially annoy people, the top three pet peeves are loud chewing. So if your coworker is or your kids, your husband or wife, loud chewing. Is that one of your pet peeves? Number two, according to Google, is bad manners. So if you have bad manners, it means you're not polite. So if someone holds the door open for you in North America, it's considered polite to say thank you to that person. So if you hold a door open for someone and the other person, they go right in and they don't say thank you to you, that would be an example of bad manners in North America. And the person who held the door open would be annoyed because that's one of their pet peeves. And number three, according to Google, is clutter. Clutter describes when a room is very disorganized or messy. So if there were things all over my office, papers everywhere, things were not neat and organized, that would be clutter. What about you? What's your pet peeve? Share your pet peeve in the comments below. Now let's do an imitation exercise where you're going to imitate my pronunciation. So you're going to listen to me say the sentence and then you are going to repeat the sentence out loud. So say the sentence out loud and try to match my pronunciation and then you'll repeat that three times for each sentence. So let's do that right now. My mom nitpicks like crazy. My mom nitpicks like crazy. My mom nitpicks like crazy. It's okay to be picky sometimes. It's okay to be picky sometimes. It's okay to be picky sometimes. I'm beat, let's call it a day. I'm beat, let's call it a day. I'm beat, let's call it a day. You shouldn't be so nosy. You shouldn't be so nosy. You shouldn't be so nosy. Being nosy is one of my pet peeves. Being nosy is one of my pet peeves. Being nosy is one of my pet peeves. Are you ready? So let's start with the first listening exercise. I'll say it three times. The party got a little out of hand. The party got a little out of hand. The party got a little out of hand. I said the party got a little out of hand. Let's talk about a little. Notice there are those two T's in the middle. 
A native speaker is just going to drop them and it will sound like lil, lil, a lil, a lil. Or a native speaker will pronounce them as Ds, a very soft D because they're between two vowels. Little, do, 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 little, little. And then you connect a, ah, a little, a little, a little. The party got a little out of. This is combined to sound like outa, outa. The party got a little outa. The party got a little outa hand, outa hand. What does that mean? To get or to become out of hand? Well, out of hand means out of control, which means that you no longer have control over the party. The party got a little out of hand. So this is not a good thing. In a more everyday context, you might say, my shopping has gotten a little out of hand. A little out of hand. A little out of hand. Which means you no longer have control over your shopping. So you're probably buying a lot of purses or jewelry or watches when you don't need to. My shopping has gotten a little out of hand. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. His email really caught me off guard. His email really caught me off guard. His email really caught me off guard. I said his email really caught me off guard. Let's talk about his email. His Although the spelling is an S, it's a Z, a voiced sound, so it's a Z. So we can use that to link to the next word because the next word starts in a vowel. So it will sound like his email, Z email. You'll hear the Z on the word email, but then you cannot have a pause between his and email. You need to pronounce them together. His email, his email, his email, his email really caught. Notice here the spelling and the pronunciation are very different. Caught, caught. His email really caught me off guard. When you catch someone off guard, this is an expression that means you surprise someone. And you surprise someone generally with information or news or something they weren't expecting. There are two options with our sentence, his email really caught me off guard. Either A, I wasn't expecting him to email me. So the fact that the email even exists surprised me, caught me off guard. Or option B, I was expecting his email, but I wasn't expecting the email to contain the information or the news that it contained. So it was the content of the email that surprised me, that caught me off guard. We don't have enough information based on this one sentence to know. It would be the overall context that would let you know if it's option A or option B. One final note that this expression to catch someone off guard is commonly used in the passive. So you could say, I was caught off guard by his email. I was caught off guard by his email. That's the passive voice and it's very commonly used with this expression. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. Thanks for sticking up for me. Thanks for sticking up for me. Thanks for sticking up for me. I said, thanks for sticking up for me. Notice that the word for sounds like for, for. This is because it's unstressed. Thanks for, thanks for sticking up for me, for me. So in both, places in this sentence. Thanks for, thanks for sticking up for me. Thanks for sticking up for me. What does this mean? When you stick up for someone, 
It means that you support someone or you defend someone, especially when they're being criticized. So it's a positive thing to stick up for someone else. Now I have seen you, my students, my amazing students, stick up for me in the comments section. Sometimes I'll be reviewing the comments and I'll see there's a negative comment like, this video was really boring. But then you, one of my awesome students, sticks up for me and you reply to that comment and you say something like, no way, this video is awesome and Jennifer's the best. I have seen this happen. And then so I could reply and say, aw, thanks for sticking up for me because you defended me, you supported me when I was being criticized. Thanks for sticking up for me. Thanks for sticking up for me. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. It's so hard sticking to this diet. It's so hard sticking to this diet. It's so hard sticking to this diet. I said, it's so hard sticking to this diet. Notice how I use a contraction, it's, it's. This is, it is, it is so hard, it's, it's so hard. Now one thing that native speakers do with the word so is we elongate it, we make it longer to emphasize how hard it is or to emphasize whatever adjective it is. It's so hard. And the longer we say the word, the more we believe that adjective is. For example, I'm so tired. Now, obviously I'm exaggerating a little bit, but native speakers can be quite dramatic and we can really hold out that so. Now let's talk about what this means. Notice in here we have this diet. It's so hard, it's so hard sticking to this diet. In this case, diet is a noun, a diet. I simply used a possessive, this diet, and it represents an eating plan. So a plan that tells you what you're going to eat, what you're not going to eat, and how much of something you're going to eat as well. That is a diet. The purpose is generally to lose weight, and usually, a diet is temporary. You temporarily do this until you reach your goal, which is to lose a certain number of pounds or percentage of body fat. But the exact same word, a diet, can also be used as a general term to refer to the food and drink that someone or a group of people consumes. So you could say, Overall, I have a very healthy diet. This is a way of saying overall, the food and drink I consume on a regular basis is healthy. Overall, I have a very healthy diet. But I'm going on a diet to lose five pounds before my vacation. Notice here the expression is to go on a diet. This is how we say to start a diet, which is your eating plan. So we use the verb go and you go on a diet. So now you know what a diet is and in this case, it's an eating plan. So let's talk about sticking to a diet. It's so hard sticking to this diet. When you stick to something, it means you continue doing that thing even though it's difficult or challenging. And that's why the example is, it's so hard sticking to this diet, continuing this diet. Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. Do you think you're gonna stick it out? Do you think you're gonna stick it out? Do you think you're gonna stick it out? I said, do you think you're 
going to stick it out. Here, you commonly sounds like yeah. Do you? Do you think? Do you think? Your will sound like your. Do you think you're, you're gonna? Going to will sound like gonna. These are all unstressed sounds and reduced sound. Do you think you're gonna? Do you think you're gonna? Stick it out. Let's talk about the combination of stick it out. So we have it, the T is actually between two vowels. So if we connect those sounds together, we'll pronounce the T like a soft D, D, D. And then on the stick, I'll take that K sound and I'll transfer it to the next sound to help smooth those out. Stick it out. But you have to say it all together. Stick it out, stick it out, stick it out stick it out. Do you think you're gonna stick it out? Now what does this mean? When you stick something out, it means you continue doing something until the end, until it's finished, until it's complete. You stick it out. So let's go back to our last example. It's so hard sticking to this diet, sticking to this diet which means continuing with something that is difficult or challenging. And then I ask, do you think you're gonna stick it out? Do you think you're going to continue with this diet until the end of this diet? So maybe this eating plan was designed for 90 days. So if you stick it out, it means you complete the eating plan. You follow the eating plan for 90 days until the end of the eating plan. These two expressions are very similar. Just remember when you stick to something, it means that you're focused on fulfilling a commitment. You're dedicated. You're going to fulfill a promise because you said you're going to do it. So that stick to something. Now, when you stick it out, it simply means you complete something to the end. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice your pronunciation and try to match it directly to mine. So I will say a sentence and then you are going to repeat the sentence out loud. And then we'll repeat each sentence three times. So let's start with the first sentence. The party got a little out of hand. The party got a little out of hand. The party got a little out of hand. His email really caught me off guard. His email really caught me off guard. His email really caught me off guard. Thanks for sticking up for me. Thanks for sticking up for me. Thanks for sticking up for me. It's so hard sticking to this diet. It's so hard sticking to this diet. It's so hard sticking to this diet. Do you think you're gonna stick it out? Do you think you're gonna stick it out? Do you think you're gonna stick it out? Are you ready? Let's start our first listening exercise. I'll say it three times. You all set for the meeting tomorrow? You all set for the meeting tomorrow? You all set for the meeting tomorrow? How'd you do with that? I said, you all set for the meeting tomorrow. Let's talk about the pronunciation changes. Notice you all, you all, you all. I said it quickly, but I did say the individual words, you all. You all set, you all set. I will point out that in the South, in Southern US, the Southern states, it's very common to combine you all into one word. Do you know what that is? 
Y'all, y'all. I'm sure you've heard this mainly in movies or TV. Y'all, y'all ready? I personally don't say y'all because I'm not from the southern US, but it is extremely common in the southern US. For me, I simply say you all, you all. I say them quickly, but I do say both words. You all set? You all set for the meeting tomorrow? Notice here how for the meeting tomorrow, for when it's unstressed, more of a reduced sound, a quick sound, it sounds like fur, fur, for the meeting. You all set fur, for the meeting, for the meeting, for the meeting tomorrow. Now before we talk about what this sentence means, you might be wondering about the grammar. Does this sentence perhaps look grammatically incorrect to you? Is there a word missing? The auxiliary verb are is missing. Are you all set for the meeting tomorrow? We need are as an auxiliary verb because this is a question. Grammatically, you need it. But in spoken English, native speakers commonly drop auxiliary verbs when they're only required grammatically, but they're not required to understand what the sentence means. So a native speaker does not need to hear an auxiliary verb to understand what a sentence means. And that's why in spoken English, we commonly get rid of them. So grammatically, are you all set for the meeting tomorrow? A native speaker would commonly say, you all set? You all set for the meeting tomorrow? And then to show it's a question, we can use a rising intonation at the end to show it's a question. Now let's talk about what this means. This has a very simple meaning. To be all set is simply to be ready or to be prepared. So it's asking the person if they're ready for the meeting tomorrow, if they're prepared for the meeting tomorrow. Native speakers commonly use this to ask if someone's ready or prepared to leave, for example, to leave a house, leave a restaurant, leave a hotel room, it doesn't matter where. And we'll just use two words with a rising intonation to show it's a question. All set? All set? I'm asking you, are you ready? All set? And then you can simply reply and say, yep, and then will leave. But you class, you're all set. All set. All set, woman. All set. All set. Let's try another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. This reports all over the map. This reports all over the map. This reports all over the map. I said, this reports all over the map. For pronunciation, notice here, this reports, report is, as a contraction, reports. This reports all over, all over. So notice how I can link those sounds together by extending that l sound to the next word because it's a vowel. All over, all over, lover, all over. This reports all over the map. The expression to be all over the map, this means that something is in a disorganized or confused state. So the report is disorganized. The report is confusing. As another example, I could say the consultant's recommendations were all over the map, to be all over the map, which means his, re his recommendations were disorganized or confusing. Maybe they talked about a lot of different topics and it was difficult to follow. They were all over the map. Yeah, this room's all over the map. Because the internet's all over the map on that. You know, charming, but all over the map. And Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. 
Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. I said, keep your eyes peeled for the turn. Notice the reduced sound for your, your eyes, your, your, your eyes. Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes peeled for, we talked about this before, for becomes an unstressed, reduced sound for. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn, for the turn, for the turn, for the turn. Notice here the sentence starts with a verb and it starts with a base verb, which means it's the imperative verb tense. And we use the imperative verb tense to give orders or suggestions. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm giving you this as an order or a suggestion. And what does that mean to keep your eyes peeled? This means to watch carefully or to be on alert. So if you're driving and you're following the directions, the GPS, you need to watch carefully for the specific streets so you know when to turn. That's the turn if you're driving. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. Watch carefully, be on alert for the turn so you don't miss it and you're not late for your important meeting. This is an expression you can use in many different situations. Let's say you're editing an important document, your resume, or something you're submitting for an assignment or to a client. You might say, keep your eyes peeled for any spelling or grammar mistakes which means as you're reviewing it, pay close attention, watch carefully, be on alert for any spelling or grammar mistakes, which is very good advice for everyone. Keep your eyes peeled. Keep your eyes peeled. Keep your eyes peeled. Are you ready to try this again? I'll say it three times. Can you just ballpark the cost for me? Can you just ballpark the cost for me? Can you just ballpark the cost for me? I said, can you just ballpark the cost for me? Can in this sentence is an auxiliary verb, so we pronounce it unstressed and it sounds like kin, kin, can you, can you. And you, you can make that unstressed too and reduce it to ya. Can you, can you, can you just? I think I did say can you, but you, it's very common to hear native speakers say ya. Yeah. Can you, can you just ballpark the cost for me? We already talked about for, it sounds like fur, for me, for me. Let's talk about this odd word here, ballpark. Did you notice that grammatically it's a verb, it's the main verb of the sentence, to ballpark something. When you ballpark something, it means you provide a rough estimate of something. And yes, a ballpark is where people play baseball, but we're not talking about baseball or sports at all. To ballpark something is to provide a rough estimate of something. In our sentence, it's a verb, to ballpark, but we commonly use this as an adjective, a figure, a ballpark figure. So the figure is the number, the cost or a statistic, and if it's a ballpark figure, it means it's a rough estimate. It's not exact, it's not precise, it's an estimate which means it's more of a range, a lower and upper range. For example, maybe a consultant is providing you a quote, an estimate on using a certain software system. And you want to know, well, how much is this going to cost my company? But the consultant can't give you an exact number at this point because he doesn't have enough information. So the consultant could say, 
If I had to ballpark it, I'd say three to five million dollars. But that's just a ballpark figure. So you know it's just an estimate. Look, just give me a number. Ballpark. Take a guess. Ballpark figure. That's fine. A ballpark figure. Let's do this one more time. I'll say it three times. Let's revisit this down the line. Let's revisit this down the line. Let's revisit this down the line. I said, let's revisit this down the line. Notice let's is a contraction for let us, let's, let's revisit. When you put re in front of a base verb, it means to do that verb again, visit this again. But for pronunciation, that re is a strong sound, e. You hear that e, revisit, revisit. Let's revisit this down the line. And notice how let's is the imperative. Let us, let's. The imperative verb tense, again, for a order or a suggestion. Let's revisit this down the line. Let's talk about down the line. This means in the future, but at an unspecified date. So it's not clear at all. You don't know when we'll revisit this, visit this again, but you know it will happen in the future, but it could be a week from now, it could be a month from now. So this is a way that a native speaker can postpone something if they don't actually want to do it, ah, I'll do it down the line. Because it's not specific on when you'll do it, it's just some point in the future. Here's another example that could apply to you. If you don't improve your English now, it could hurt your career down the line. Now notice when I say down the line, I'm not being specific on when your lack of English skills could hurt your career, but at some point in the future. It could be tomorrow, it could be a week from now, it could be a year from now. And that's why it's so important that you're here with me improving your English. Amazing job improving your listening skills. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can improve your pronunciation and practice these pronunciation changes. So I'll say the sentence and then I want you to say the sentence out loud and try to imitate my pronunciation and I'll repeat each sentence three times. So let's do that now. You all set for the meeting tomorrow? You all set for the meeting tomorrow? You all set for the meeting tomorrow? This reports all over the map. This reports all over the map. This reports all over the map. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. Keep your eyes peeled for the turn. Can you just ballpark the cost for me? Can you just ballpark the cost for me? Can you just ballpark the cost for me? Let's revisit this down the line. Let's revisit this down the line. Let's revisit this down the line. Are you ready? Here we go with the first listening exercise. I'll say it three times. Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? Did you get this one? I said, have you edited it yet? This is extremely difficult to say. It was difficult for me to say just now. Have you edited it? So notice we have edited, edit, and then in the ED form, the past simple form, edited, edited. 
That's the past simple of to edit, edited. Now we have to add on it, and you're going to combine that sound to edited. So we already have e did did. Now we're going to add on it to it. Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? That is extremely difficult, even for me to say. I would say this is a tongue twister, and most likely I wouldn't even use it. I would change it to the noun to avoid this very difficult pronunciation. Have you edited the report yet? Have you edited the document yet? Now let's talk about the grammar. What do you notice about this? Well, first of all, it's in question form, and what verb tense is this? It's the present perfect. Have you edited? So we have have or has conjugated with the subject. Have you? And then the past participle edited. And then we have yet because yet is commonly used in question form with the present perfect. Yet is also used in negative form with the present perfect. So to answer this negatively, I could say I haven't edited it yet. I haven't edited it yet. And remember that we use already with the present perfect for affirmative statements, positive statements. Yes, I've already edited it. Edited it together on my Mac. Edited it, didn't you? That's my Took that video. Edited it. And woo, I'm glad I don't have to say that anymore because it was very difficult even for me. Let's try this again. Here's your listening exercise. Does she have what it takes to move up? Does she have what it takes to move up? Does she have what it takes to move up? I said, does she have what it takes to move up? Let's talk about does she. Does is an auxiliary verb, so we can pronounce it very quickly in an unstressed pronunciation. Does, does. Now, she begins with a sh, so we're going to combine those two sounds together. Does she, does she, does she, does she. We can combine what it into what it. Notice I have a soft D because we have a T between two vowels, which we pronounce as a soft D sound. What it, what it. Does she have what it takes to move up? To, to move up. So two will become unstressed, to move up. So I'll use that V to combine those together. To move up, move up, to move up. Let's talk about what this means. Let's talk about the expression to have what it takes. This means that you have the skills or the characteristics necessary to become successful. Right now, I hope you're thinking, Jennifer, I have what it takes to become fluent, which means you have the skills or the qualities to become successful in that particular area. So right now you, be, you might be thinking, well, I don't have the fluency skills, but do you have the qualities, the qualities required, patience, consistency, motivation, dedication. Those are the qualities necessary to be successful when learning a language. So you don't need the skills, you need the qualities in order to say, yes, Jennifer, I have what it takes to become fluent. So put that in the comments because I know that you have what it takes. Now let's talk about to move up, to move up. In a business context, when you move up, it means you 
get a more important position within your company. So basically, you get a promotion, which is a very good thing. And it's amazing that you're here right now doing this because improving your communication skills will help you move up a lot faster. It will help you advance in your career, get a promotion a lot faster. I don't have what it takes. Do you have what it takes? Because I have what it takes. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. I'm finally all caught up. I'm finally all caught up. I'm finally all caught up. I said, I'm finally all caught up. Of course, caught sounds like ought, ought, caught. Now, because up is a vowel, so now we have caught up, we have a T between two vowels. Again, I'll pronounce it as a soft D, but I have to combine the sounds together. Caught up, caught up, dub, caught up, caught up. I'm finally all caught up. Let's talk about what this means. The expression is to be caught up. I am caught up. I'm finally all caught up, to be caught up. This means that you've finished all the tasks that you were previously assigned. So maybe you had some tasks that you were supposed to do last week, but you didn't have time. And now, today, you had time, so you completed those tasks. So then you can say, I'm finally all caught up. Notice in my example, I said all caught up. Here, all simply means 100% entirely. It's unnecessary to include it, but native speakers really like to include this word and we use it quite frequently. So you could say, I'm caught up, I'm all caught up, they have the exact same meaning, but a native speaker will likely add all. To share another example using this expression, I could say, I'm all caught up on my emails. So here, notice I mentioned the specific task, on my emails. So that means I either read the emails that I was supposed to read last week or even yesterday or even earlier today, or maybe I responded to the emails as well. I'm all caught up on my emails. All caught up. <laughs> okay, we're all caught up. Oh, you all caught up. Do you want to try another listening exercise? I'll say it three times. Do you have a sec to bring him up to speed? Do you have a sec to bring him up to speed? Do you have a sec to bring him up to speed? I said, do you have a sec to bring them up to speed? Let's talk about do you have a. I can combine do you and say do ya, do ya. Have a, have a. Do ya have a, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a sec? Notice that k sound in there, sec. Do you have a sec to bring them? I can reduce the them, just get rid of that th, and I'm left with m, and I have to add it to the word before, bring them. Bring them up to, up to speed, up to speed. Here, sec, this is the short form of the word second. This is very commonly used as a question. Do you have a sec? Do you have a sec? I'm asking you for a short amount of time. Do you have a sec? And this is commonly used before you ask for help or before you want to, to start a discussion. Do you have a sec? Can you review this document? Do you have a sec? Can we discuss the conference? Let's talk about to bring someone up to speed up to speed. This is an expression and when it's when you share the latest or most recent news 
and information on a specific topic. So let's say you were on vacation for one week. And during that one week, you weren't checking your emails, you weren't talking to anyone at work. So you don't have the latest information or news. When you get back, you might say, I was on vacation for a week. Can you bring me up to speed on the conference? So you can specify something specific, the conference, on the conference. And the person knows to share information or news related to the conference within the last week because that's the information or news that you don't have. Uh, Dr. Cox, do you have a sec? Hey, Jack. Do you have a sec? Do you have a sec to talk uh, about my piece? Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. Are you going out tonight? Are you going out tonight? Are you going out tonight? This was an easy one, right? Are you going out tonight? The pronunciation is quite clear. Notice how we can combine out tonight together. When I say out, I'm not going to pronounce that T. Out. Out. The T is just silent. But tonight starts with a T. So I can use that T from tonight for both words if I say them together, out tonight, out tonight, out tonight. So you can combine those together. Are you going out tonight? I included this easy example because this is a very common expression that native speakers use and perhaps you don't know what it means or you don't feel confident using it yourself. To go out, that's the expression, to go out. This is when you do a social activity outside of your home. So you leave your home to do something social, so something fun. Perhaps it's to have a nice dinner with your significant other or your family or friends, or it's to go to a movie. Are you going out? Are you going out tonight? Notice that this is in the present continuous because it's asking about a plan in progress. Are you going out tonight? But the expression is to go out. So your verb is go. If it were last night, you would say, oh, I went out last night. Now this isn't clear what you did. So someone would have to ask you, oh, what did you do? And then you could tell them, oh, I went to the movies. Want to go out tonight? Are we going out tonight? You want to go out tonight? Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice this fast pronunciation. I'm going to say each sentence again, and I'm going to give you time to say the sentence out loud. And then I'll repeat each sentence three times. Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? Does she have what it takes to move up? Does she have what it takes to move up? Does she have what it takes to move up? I'm finally all caught up. I'm finally all caught up. I'm finally all caught up. Do you have a sec to bring him up to speed? Do you have a sec to bring him up to speed? Do you have a sec to bring him up to speed? Are you going out tonight? Are you going out tonight? Are you going out tonight? Amazing job with this. Now, to be honest, I really regret using edited it as one of my examples because it was extremely difficult for me to say. So I'm sure it was extremely difficult for you to say as well. So I'm going to say that's a tongue twister and it's very difficult. So remember, have you edited? You need edited, three sounds. Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? Have you edited it yet? Put that in the comments. Have you edited it yet? 
Put that in the comments and now I'm feeling more comfortable with that. So you can practice that as well. Amazing job with this lesson. Congratulations on everything that you learned today. Of course, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you keep improving your English with this lesson right now.